Good afternoon. I'm Rick Barron. I'm the Executive Vice Chancellor for Health Affairs, and I'm also the Executive Director of NextGen Precision Health. And it's a pleasure to welcome you to the inaugural NextGen Precision Health Discovery Series. Uh, this is a very exciting time for myself and the NextGen leadership team to be at this point in time where we're kicking this series off. I'm going to tell you more about future monthly seminars during the course of the talk. But during this next 45 minutes or so, I want to tell all the listeners about where we are now in NextGen and where we're going. And there is a lot happening and it's actually happening very fast. Uh, if you can advance to the next slide, please, Ashley. And I'm aware that as I give this presentation, uh, there has been a there, there has been a lot of activity in NextGen before I arrived at MU last May, and one of my favorite sayings is uh, "standing on the shoulders of giants," and I and I feel like that is the case here. Uh, I'm also a big fan of of medical history, uh, and this phrase actually comes from Greek mythology, where the servant Sedelion would uh, stand on the shoulders of the giant Orion. It's been used thousands of times over the years in various uh, variations. Isaac Newton uh, most famously said, if I had been further, if I've seen further than others, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants, but he, would, he did not invent the same. So this is all just to say that uh, there has been a lot of work done in the Next Gen Precision Health Initiative over a number of years. Uh, and I am glad to be the, uh, the leader of the initiative. And we have a great team and I'm excited to tell you about what is developing. Next slide, please. So what is Precision Health? And I'm going to make this a bit personal and tell you how Precision Health has affected my patients and my career uh, as a result. So I'm a neurologist and my specialty is neuromuscular disorders. So I take care of uh, children and adults with severe diseases of the muscles and nerves. One of them is spinal muscular atrophy. Spinal muscular atrophy is due to a genetic mutation. It's autosomal recessive, uh, and it has been uncurable and a devastating illness from which uh, people die, uh, children die within a year or two if they're not put on a ventilator. So uh, the gene for spinal muscular atrophy was uh, first discovered in 1995. And it took about 20 years for drugs to deal with that gene defect came on the market and were FDA approved. One is called Speranza, and that's an anti-sense drug, which changes uh, the messaging of, of, of the transcription. And the other is Zolgensma, which is actually in putting normal genes into patients. So it's actually gene therapy. Both these now are FDA approved. So this picture, is of two children with spinal muscular atrophy and their mother uh, and, uh, and, and one of my physician colleagues. Uh, so I saw this, uh, uh, the, these kids in Dallas and uh, the, uh, the, the boy in the wheelchair has had SMA his whole life and it's had a devastating result. He's on a ventilator, it's attached to the wheelchair. The uh, one-year-old uh, was identified as having the gene defect when the mother was still pregnant. And she was enrolled in one of the early Speranza studies so that the day that she was delivered, she began receiving intrathecal Speranza. She is normal uh, motor function. She was running around the room. We put her on her brother's lap. You can see all the activity there. The boy's on Speranza too, but it's, it's too late to really make any appreciable difference. Um, but this is the type of impact precision health delivery can have uh, on, on patients' lives. It's the biggest transformative change that I've seen in my career as a physician. And this is one example. There are other examples in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, another disease I treat. And the amazing thing about MU is that we have researchers at, uh, at MU like Chris Lorson studying SMA and Duan Sheng Dong studying Duchenne muscular dystrophy who are, are working on the next generation of these drugs for serious diseases. So that's an example of precision health. Uh, next slide, please. 
So precision health, that's one example, but there are other examples too. And I really like to consider precision health from the gene level to the population level. So you can consider it cells to society or genes to generation approach. So what I just showed you was an example of finding an abnormal gene and then ultimately uh, being able to do gene therapy in two different ways, uh, which is uh, definitely personalized medicine. You can also do very precise cell imaging at the cellular level with electron microscopy and other tools. That's precision health. You can also very precisely look at organs, brain, uh, joints, other organs with MRI, CT, PET, and other imaging. That is also an example of precision health. Um, uh, targeted uh, uh, personalized delivery. Well, gene delivery clearly is personalized medicine, but you can also look at all the demographic features of the patient and risk factors and tailor a therapeutic program for them, uh, for that particular individual. And then you can also look at population trends and, and tendencies and come up with a healthcare approach for a particular population, whether or not it be rural, underserved population, or a variety of different examples. So all of those things are examples of precision health. And, and so it, in order to do this sort of research, you have to start at the basic research level. Sometimes animal models are used, then you get to clinical trials, and then some, and if it's a drug or a device, you eventually can get it to market. Um, so th that is the spectrum of precision health, if you will. Next slide, please. So why can we make next-gen precision health initiative, initiative succeed in Missouri? There are a number of reasons that I wanna outline. Uh, First, it, this initiative is the highest priority of our four research universities. Uh, Dr. Uh, or President Choi has made it our highest priority and, and all of the chancellors at each of the, each of the campuses have done so as well. We have some really amazing strengths in, at the University of Missouri. We have the MER, which is a, a nationally ranked facility, uh, a nuclear reactor, um, where we can develop radio pharmaceuticals. Uh, we ha have four NIH funded centers for comparative medicine, which is uh, the only uh, example of this in the United States where a lot of those animal model studies uh, can be done. And I know Dr. Lorson, who's doing his work in SMA has relied heavily on this resource in order to develop his new drugs uh, uh, for, for spinal muscular atrophy. And then of course, we're building a one of a kind building on the Columbia campus um, that can really house the entire pipeline from cell studies to animal modeling to human testing uh, and even manufacturing to some extent. And uh, these are just several other reasons why I think this is uh, Missouri's the right place to do next gen precision health initiative and, and there are more as well. Um, so, and those are highlighted on our next slide. Uh, if you can advance to the next slide, please. So in addition to the things that I just mentioned, we have the amazing talent, talent at our four campuses, housed in a variety of uh, schools, departments, institutes, and centers. Some of them are highlighted here on this slide. And uh, we are trying to pull the talent together from uh, uh, all of these, uh, all of these uh, resources to be involved in the Next Gen Precision Health Initiative. Some of these uh, I'm gonna talk about during the remainder of this talk. Uh, next slide, please. Now, we also have a problem that we need to face in that Missouri can do much better in taking care of our population from a healthcare standpoint. Uh, we are ranked fair, out of 50 states uh, fairly low uh, as far as success and, and fairly poor as, 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 if you're 39th, 40th, and 39th in cancer deaths, cardiovascular deaths, and mental distress. So we have a lot of work to do to improve the health of our population. And we think Next Gen Precision Health Initiative is, is a way to tackle this. So where are we now, which is our next slide. And I'll tell you where we're at now in, in Next Gen. Let me start with the schematic. So if we can go to the next slide. This is a schematic that we developed uh, over the last seven or eight months. Uh, which illustrates a couple of points. One is that our overall goal is to improve healthcare outcomes for Missourians 
and really widely for the United States and the world as well. So how do we do that? Well, I'm gonna talk about our six pillars of emphasis uh, in the next slide, uh, but in order to uh, tackle research in each of these areas, we need to have a number of building blocks. One of them is our UM system, which I've already discussed. The other one is the infrastructure that exists in each one of these campuses. So whether or not it's laboratories, imaging, electron microscopy, I'm gonna talk about some of the uh, amazing infrastructure that's gonna be in this building, but not everything is based in the building, but in the building, we're gonna have a clinical translational science unit, uh, a, a good manufacturing process uh, laboratory. We also have to have partnerships. We have to have key partnerships with industry, with government, with our, with our regional partners, and of course, uh, philanthropic partnerships. We are really doubling down on data science and using big data to improve the health uh, of, our, of our population. Health informatics data, which I'm gonna talk about in this talk, and bioinformatics data, which is the, comes out of genomics and proteomics. And then we have to work as a team. None of this can happen uh, unless we have uh, a great deal of team science and uh, healthcare workers uh, from all disciplines uh, and involvement of our patients in, in our and our stakeholders as well. So what about those six key pillars, which are the vertical bars on the schematic? Let's go to the next slide. Uh, these areas of emphasis were, uh, were, were well thought out uh, over the preceding uh, several years. Uh, a couple were added earlier, this, uh, earlier in 2020. Um, so the areas of emphasis are cancer, our neuroscience, our cardiovascular metabolic disorders, which is very broad, population health, and uh, it, which can be uh, health of the population with regard to any uh, disorder, disease process, um, healthcare delivery, which is a, a way to precisely deliver specific types of healthcare for a patient based on their demographic uh, and phenotypic uh, profile. And then emerging areas, um, new things that come up, such as COVID, infectious disease, or, or, or other uh, emerging areas. And each one of these columns has a faculty research lead, which was identified uh, in, in late 2019 and early 2020. Uh, and uh, these faculty research leads are content experts and research experts in each one of these areas. They come from, uh, Camp, uh, uh, from currently they come from the Columbia campus and the UMKC campus, um, and they come from a variety of schools in, in our in our system. They actually have a number of different roles. Um, early on, uh, earlier in 2020, they convened uh, focus groups uh, of, of researchers in their area to uh, get a lay of the land and to figure out what direction uh, research needed to go in their particular area. Um, after I arrived, we began vetting uh, potential candidates that are gonna be moving into the next gen building. And I'm gonna talk about them. And we came up with occupancy rules for, for the building. And now we're asking the faculty research leads to uh, lead uh, science seminars and ideas labs to come up with uh, new approaches to tackling these diseases and actually to submit to submit grants. Uh, and so uh, if we can go to the next slide, and it, which is a picture of our building, a beautiful building that's going up on the uh, Columbia campus, very large building, very costly building, which is on time and on budget. Uh, and we have a grand opening scheduled October 19, 2021. More about that at the end of my talk. This is a fairly recent uh, picture of the building, all the glasses up. And if anyone wants to get a tour of the building, they can contact me or anyone on our team. The information will be at the end and we can arrange for you to have a tour of this amazing facility. Uh, go to the next slide. This is a really unique facility which has features in it that I think are not present on any other sort of research facility in the United States because it houses so many different types of precision health uh, research. So it's basically five stories. Uh, in the ground floor, uh, 
underground, uh, there is a vivarium, there is uh, our, a Siemens imaging core, which you're going to uh, uh, hear more about it, uh, later in the talk. There is an electron microscopy suite, uh, and uh, uh, which I'm not going to spend a lot of time on in this talk, but I think in one of our upcoming discovery lecture series, uh, we'll have our EM core experts uh, give a session on that. The, um, the, the uh, cardiovascular metabolic disorders team, which I'm going to show you the pictures of the uh, uh, first wave of scientists going in in the next slide, they're going to go on the third floor. The cancer and immunology team is going to the second floor. The purple is wet lab space. Uh, and so the long, the long rectangular building is where the wet labs are. Uh, and the, um, the smaller uh, uh, sort of square uh, is, um, is where the offices are. Um, on the third floor in the yellow office area, we're building a, a clinical translational science unit, which is still being developed, but this is going to be a place where patients can come for first in human and other research trials, cutting edge treatments. In the second floor, the yellow space is going to be a, a, a space for our industry partners, innovation center, uh, for them to be able to be able to come into this building and collaborate and talk to our, to our scientists. Uh, on the uh, on the, on the first floor, uh, there's going to be a number of conference, conference rooms, some wet lab space, and a facility where drugs, devices, and cell cultures uh, can be produced in a clean room environment and would meet the grade for good manufacturing pra uh, practice core, which is essential for developing new products. So to have all this in one building, from wet lab research, animal research, Im uh, uh, organ imaging, cell imaging, uh, uh, and a unit to, in order to uh, treat patients with new drugs and then have industry involvement, I believe is very unique. Next slide, please. I'm gonna show you pictures of, of what it's going to look like. Um, the lab, each of the floors that have these open lab concept is 28,000 square feet of open lab space it's going to, obviously, it has uh, glass all around, um, so it's going to be very light. Uh, 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 there'll be a lot of light coming into the building. Um, it's it's going to emphasize the team science approach because there will not be any walls in these large open labs. And so uh, this will really, I believe, enhance the, uh, uh, team research. Uh, the next slide, I believe, is a, a picture of the uh, some of the open spaces. Uh, and the very core of the next gen precision health initiative is breaking down barriers to accelerate uh, the time it takes for research to become treatment. We think this is best done in this open space environment. So it's literally uh, in the design of the building uh, and there's very few walls. And this is some of the areas on the first floor which are gonna be uh, gathering spaces. And we think this is gonna be very popular and will be conducive to generating new ideas between scientists and with our industry partners. Next slide. So from the street level, you're gonna be able to see our good manufacturing practice clean rooms. Um, here's a rendition of what it will look like. Uh, and and we, uh, I, I know that our scientists are gonna be very excited to have this sort of capability in, on our campus as well as our industry partners. So why don't we go to the next slide? And this is an exciting slide because this is the first wave of our existing scientists that are going to be moving into the building in October when we open our doors. And as I mentioned, our first focus is, uh, is gonna be on cancer and immunology on one of the floors and cardiovascular and metabolic disorders on, on the other. Um, they're not gonna take up all the space on either of the floors. So we have room for expansion of these teams with new faculty and in, and in other areas as well. But these uh, scientists uh, were selected by going through a significant vetting process uh, they all have are successful in getting uh, federal funding. Some have not only NIH funding, but also VA funding. 
and we hope that the VA is going to be a partner uh, in, in this enterprise. Uh, and they all have a history of working as teams together. And we believe by putting these uh, teams, to, these small teams together, we can coalesce, coalesce them into larger teams of cancer and immunology researchers. Some are quite new to the campus, like Dr. Sherwin and Dr. Yolsu. They really just arrived. So they're going to be joining the cancer and immunology team. Uh, some of these uh, uh, researchers do both uh, wet lab and animal work and human trials work, such as Dr. Rector and Dr. Park. So they're going to be working in both the CTSU and in the, in the wet lab area. Uh, so we're really very excited about this. And I'd call them next gen knots. Why next gen knots? Um, well, it, it, I'm playing off the word astronauts, argonauts. It's an old Greek term meaning sailors. So sailors that sailed the seas, they were discoverers. So these are our first wave of discoverers into this new facility. And uh, uh, we believe that uh, uh, they'll be able to start moving in equipment and uh, in uh, late August, or early September, but the grand opening, the official ribbon cutting will be in October. So those are our first wave of our next gen knots. Now let me tell you about some of the really cool equipment in the building. So in partnership with Siemens Healthineers, we are going to have some of the uh, most up-to-date state-of-the-art imaging to image or uh, image the whole body and, and organs uh, uh, within the body in this, in this building, in the ground floor. And the idea is to partner with Siemens and Siemens is, is really uh, using uh, this site, uh, NMU, to bring the next generation of products, much like Cerner has uh, in the field of health informatics or long-term partnership with, with, with Cerner. This is another partnership, but with another uh, national uh, healthcare provider, uh, Siemens. And if we go to the next slide, uh, uh, what I'm really excited about is the imaging equipment that's going in this that's going in this building. So not only is there going to be a 3T MRI, which is what has been routinely used for both clinical care and research, and there's going to be a PET CT, uh, 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 which is uh, used for clinical care and research, but there's also a new 7T MRI. This is one of the most high, high um, powerful magnets to image the body that, uh, that is available. And it's the, it's the brand new generation of these magnets. So you can see in that picture of the brain here, the difference between the detail you can see in the old 1.5 Tesla magnet, which are still used, the 3T magnet, which is the most commonly used, and then the 7T magnet. This is visualizing blood vessels of and you can see how much more detail you can get on the 7T, but also the brain anatomical truck structures are much uh, better seen on the 7T. This will be the only 7T magnet in the state of Missouri and in, and in our surrounding, several of our surrounding states as well. Uh, the magnet is essentially becoming a magnet uh, for uh, researchers that want to use it and for scientists that want to move to the University of Missouri to be able to access this magnet. But we know we have a lot of interest already from our partners at Washington University. They don't have a 7T at WashU. And so they're going to be uh, uh, doing protocols on our magnet here in Columbia, sending patients over uh, uh, to use this tool. Um, these, uh, this type of equipment uh, will be used for human patients for clinical use human patients for our, our, our human research participants, uh, companion animals for clinical use, and then research animals. So the, the whole gamut. Uh, and uh, uh, here's a picture of, uh, I believe, the, the 7T magnet, uh, a cartoon of it, and a picture of our own Dr. Jeff Bryan, uh, who's one of our faculty research leads in the, in the vet school holding a companion animal. I always love showing this picture. It makes any talk better showing Dr. Bryan with one of the with one of the pets. Um, but we are we're going to be able to use these uh, uh, the, these pieces of equipment to investigate uh, epilepsy, brain cancer, Alzheimer's, dementia, cancer uh, uh, anywhere in the body. 
and uh, uh, it, this is really going to elevate our game uh, in the imaging research world. And I'll tell you how it's influencing it uh, as we move forward in a couple of slides. So what I've been really going over so far is uh, a lot of the exciting stuff in this new building that's going to be opening in October. But I do want to emphasize, and really one of the themes of this presentation today, is that Next Gen Precision Health Initiative is really more than a building. So here's pictures of our four campuses. Um, but uh, more than the pictures of the campuses are the investigators and the scientists on these campuses. So I'm going to give you several examples here of, uh, of Next Gen Precision Health research that is uh, uh, occurring or that will occur on, on our campuses as part of our team science initiative. So let's go to the next slide. So I've already mentioned that one of the basic foundation blocks uh, of our Next Gen Precision Health uh, schematic was big data. So we are really doubling down on our ability to analyze data. Uh, and one of the pieces of data is health informatics data. So, uh, Dr. Choi and uh, uh, the chance and the chancellors on the other campuses have created over the last year a next gen data science and analytics innovation center next gen DSAIC. Uh, and uh, a variety of different types of data will be able to be analyzed uh, using this infrastructure that's being built. One of them is health informatics data. So currently the initiative is being led by uh, two of our engineering leaders, Dr. Kevin Truman on the UMKC campus and Noah Manring on the MU campus. And this is truly a joint partnership in looking at big data. Uh, University of Missouri and UMKC recently hired Dr. Russ Waitman, who's a medical informatics specialist uh, to join the MU team. And Dr. Waitman uh, has developed a uh, uh, team that can look into electronic medical record data and can extract the, the pearls and nuggets out of that uh, into a research platform that can be used to ask questions about uh, patients' health, the, the health of a population, about individual patients, uh, how to find patients for future trials, and to leverage the EMR as a major tool for research. And so uh, Dr. Waitman is the next gen director of medical informatics on our uh, horizontal uh, data science platform. And he is an integral member of the next gen DSAIC team that's happening on both campuses. Dr. Waitman has a faculty appointment on both campuses to show the bi-campus uh, partnership. Next slide, please. So another uh, example of partnership across the campuses is in addiction research. We have very successful addiction researchers in the University of Missouri system. Some have been here uh, for a few years and some have just arrived. So one that recently arrived from, uh, South, from uh, South Carolina is Brett Frohlinger. So he's a nationally recognized addiction researcher and he has set up on the Columbia campus, the Next Gen Cognitive Neuroscience System core this is actually not in the building. It's a separate facility. Um, uh, and uh, uh, we, we have, uh, Dr. Froliger and, and, and the Next Gen team were able to uh, identify addiction researchers on, the, on our other campuses. First, we had Dennis McCarthy and Julie Cap on our MU campus, which had been doing addiction research for some time. And then uh, right, Dr. Winogard and Dr. Hagel on the UMSL and UMKC campuses are very successful addiction researchers. So through the next gen uh, resources, we have brought this team of addiction researchers together and they are now currently working on several uh, uh, team science uh, and, uh, federal applications for grant funding. So this is very exciting. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the, the this is a group that I just recently found out about. And that's, this, that's the group on both the Columbia campus and the uh, Rolla S&T campus that are doing research in traumatic brain injury. 
So I was, uh, I've been making the rounds since I, since I arrived here. And about a month ago, I had a great meeting with Dr. Gray's son, uh, uh, emeritus professor uh, in biochemistry who had an Alzheimer's disease uh, program project for over a decade and, and uh, her research partner, uh, Gary Weissman. And they told me about a young scientist in our pathology department, Dr. Zhu, and uh, uh, he's well-funded brain trauma scientist, and he's also looking at Alzheimer's disease. And then I found out that in Rala, there is a brain uh, trauma research team led by Casey Burton and Dr. Kwan. Uh, and I talked, got them on the phone, and that uh, we had a nice virtual visit. And they told me about a consortium I was not even aware of, the Acute Effects of Neurotrauma Consortium. This is an MU and SNT joint collaborative project. Um, uh, they have been he heavily leveraging uh, the Army Research Laboratory at Leonard uh, and the Leonard Wood Institute. Uh, and, um, and they've had a great deal of success in, in getting federal funding. Uh, they meet they had been meeting in person every two weeks. Now with COVID, it's mainly been virtual meetings, but this is an amazing gem that, that uh, I discovered in our MU system. And uh, we are now officially adopting them as part of the Next Gen Precision Health Initiative. And uh, we're gonna be helping them uh, with uh, convening their meetings and, and with any other resources that we can provide. Uh, next slide, please. And I also wanna, mentioned Dr. Rob Paul, who's an amazing imaging analysis researcher in the UMSL campus. And I talked to Dr. Paul, I heard about him and I, uh, after I arrived and I talked to him in the summer uh, and I, I discovered that he has uh, uh, many NIH grants where imaging research from around the world uh, is done and the images get sent to him and he's, he's this uh, guru at analysis of these images. Um, and that was really before I realized the depth that we're creating in our next gen imaging center here, which I'm gonna tell you about in just a minute. And um, so I'm looking for opportunities for Dr. Paul uh, to, to partner with Dr. Telly Altis, our head of radiology and the team that she's recruiting uh, so that they can work together as a next gen precision health imaging team. So Dr. Paul, if you're listening, I owe you another call, Dr. Altis and I do, and we're gonna get you updated on on some of the stuff I'm gonna mention in this talk, but give you a little more detail about it. Next slide. Uh, I, I, the final uh, researcher that I wanted to highlight who is not physically in the building, but is a huge part of our next gen precision health team is Dr. Carolyn Anderson, who recently relocated uh, to, uh, re located to MU. Uh, she was at Pitt uh, for about nine years. And before that, she was at Wash U for almost 20 years. So she is a nationally recognized expert in developing uh, uh, radio pharmaceutical agents for cancer. So she relocated, her and her husband, who's also a researcher uh, and part of the team, they relocated their laboratory here to MU. It basically because they knew we had the MER reactor um, and we were uh, and we were building the next gen uh, precision health initiative. And that was the big attraction. Uh, and so uh, uh, if I can go to the next slide, the uh, our, as I already alluded to earlier, our nuclear reactor has had a huge impact in developing a number of radio pharmaceuticals that really changed the lives of, of people with cancer uh, and also with, with thyroid disease that is non-cancerous. And that's done at the MER. Uh, Dr. Uh, Anderson will be partnering with David uh, uh, Robertson, at, uh, who, who leads the MER, and to develop new radiopharmaceutical agents. And then or the plan is for those to be tested on patients in our new next-gen facility. Uh, our... Uh, reactor is uh, world renowned. And uh, we recently uh, announced a, an agreement between a subsidiary of Novartis, Advanced Accelerator Applications, which is essentially Novartis. And we are gonna provide uh, AAA Novartis uh, uh, 
lutetium for uh, targeted therapy of certain types of cancer tumors. And we, we're going to be the sole provider uh, uh, for in the U.S. and around the world uh, for, for, this, um, for this compound. Uh, previously, Lutathera was developed, and it is one of the uh, one of the agents that MU developed that is a treatment for pancreatic cancer, which can dramatically extend the lives of certain types of pan pancreatic cancer patients. And so our goal is to double down and develop mo more of these with our industry partners. And Dr. Anderson is a part of that plan. Next slide. So that is uh, a little bit about my vision of what precision health research is. The tools we have in the uh, the tools we have available, the partnerships that we have, and now I want to talk to you about where are we going uh, with this initiative. So, if we go to the next slide, this is another artist picture of the completed tower, uh, uh, next gen building. And so, we, as I mentioned, we've already identified the occupants, uh, the first wave occupants were cardiovascular, metabolic, and cancer immunology, uh, Dr. Tom Spencer, who is one of the faculty research leads, he's also the scientific director of NextGen, uh, and we partner together on getting this operation off the ground with, a, with a, a large team. And he also was recently named the interim vice chancellor of research for the, for the Columbia campus. Uh, he and I are identifying uh, other occupants of the building with the faculty research leads for in engineering, in genomics, uh, in imaging, which I'm going to get to in, in just a minute, and in proteomics. Uh, as I alluded to when I showed you the schematic of the floors, uh, we are uh, going to be developing one of the innovation tower spaces for industry touchdown space with partners such as Siemens, Cerner, and others. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and we also have now on, uh, an initiative to hire a number of imaging scientists that are going to be the scientists that operate and do research on and facilitate others to do research on the amazing imaging facility in this um, in this in this building, uh, and uh, that leads me to the next slide, which is recruitment. So we know we have a lot of talent on this campus and on and on UMKC and in UMSOL and in SNT. Uh, but we need more talent in order to achieve our goals. Uh, I like this picture because on the far right in neuromuscular is Dr. Dongchen Duan, who's developing cutting edge research in Duchenne dystrophy. Uh, currently he's doing it in dog models, but we, his, we, the, uh, hopefully soon his drug will be, uh, can be done in humans and can be done uh, in our facility. Uh, Dr. Liu is a world-class cardiovascular uh, researcher. Um, this is a picture of our nuclear reactor where drugs are made for, for cancer uh, treatment, as I mentioned. Uh, uh, we uh, uh, believe that there, there's great value in having an emphasis in Alzheimer's disease for a number of reasons. And then we have our imaging uh, suite on the uh, example of a, a patient being imaged on the far left. So we know that we need to recruit in all of these areas uh, to build on the talent that we already have. So if we go to the next slide, one of these recruitment clusters that I'm very excited about is, is currently uh, being led by Dr. Tally Altus, our chair of radiology. Uh, Dr. Altus, uh, uh, in anticipation of the next gen building opening in October, uh, has been contacted by a number of scientists who want to be in this building. Uh, and uh, she has a number of outstanding candidates uh, uh, who are leaders in the field of, of imaging who, want, who appear to want to re relocate to Mizzou because of this facility and, and because of the, uh, uh, of the leadership of Dr. Altus. So, uh, we, Dr. Altus and a team of uh, deans and chairs uh, throughout the campus are working on recruiting this cluster hire. All of the faculty will not only be in radiology, 
but they'll also have a joint appointment in either one of the arts and science or one of the engineering uh, departments. Uh, this will really uh, get the entire uh, campus or a good part of the campus engaged in the Next Gen Initiative. And we're hoping that uh, we can get all of these scientists and that, and that they would arrive uh, in late summer before the, uh, or, or September, before the building opens in October. Let me go to the next slide. Another thing that we're, that is happening and that we're working on as we go into the future is the Next Gen Healthcare Institute for Innovations and Quality. This is a picture of my colleague, Dr. John Spertus, who I've known for years. He's a world-class cardiology researcher and a UMKC professor. Um, uh, and he does his work out of St. Luke's Hospital and at UMKC School of Medicine. John uh, is one of our faculty research leads, and he's leading the precision health delivery emphasis. Um, he's been doing this work for a number of years in the cardiology field, but now uh, uh, Chancellor Agrawal and uh, uh, Vice Chancellor Research Liu on the UMKC campus have, uh, uh, have uh, worked with John to create this new institute for healthcare uh, innovations and quality. John wants to use his model for improving the health of cardiology patients and expand it uh, to, uh, to beyond uh, cardiology to other, area, uh, other disorders. And this institute will be the, um, the infrastructure tool that he is going to use to uh, get NIH grants in order to roll out these uh, uh, precision health protocols, not only in the Kansas City uh, area, but also at MUHC. And we're very excited about this new initiative that John is leading. And we'll be having John here to give a Next Gen Discovery Lecture uh, series uh, uh, in the next few months. Um, even before that, I think we're going to have him have a webinar with faculty that want to hear more about John's research uh, ideas uh, so that they can get involved uh, uh, with the project that he's trying to get off the ground right now. So that leads us, it's a good segue to the next slide. How can you get involved with NextGen? And uh, there's a number of ways. So first of all, you can continue to tune in to this lecture series, which is going to occur monthly. And on the next slide, I highlight some of the upcoming, uh, upcoming speakers. On March 10th, we have Dr. Russ Waitman, uh, who is going to uh, talk about precision health informatics and research from the electronic medical record. And you're gonna really enjoy Dr. Waitman's presentation. And you can see his affiliations are with both to the Columbia and to the Kansas City uh, University of Missouri campuses. Most of the time when we have these discovery series, we're going to use uh, our internal talent. But at times we're going to have people from other institutions give presentations. And I'm very excited uh, to have Dr. Ann Sales from the University of Michigan come to give our April 6th lecture. She's an implementation science uh, uh, expert. I met her through Dr. Spertus, actually, um, and they've been working together for some time. And uh, she's going to uh, give the April 6th lecture, and she's also going to be available to meet a number of people on campus. She'll be here probably for a couple of days. So when we have visiting lectures come, and she's actually going to come in person, uh, she, she will be all vaccinated up. Uh, so uh, she'll be coming to visit the campus. Uh, we'll probably, most people will be watching her lecture virtually, but she'll be having one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings with a number, of, uh, a number of faculty. And if anyone's interested in meeting her, uh, please let me know. I know Dr. Spertus will be coming in town for that. And we actually have lectures scheduled throughout the year at this point. But if you, if you have any ideas for either University of Missouri uh, lectures that you think we should highlight, for any particular programs that you think we should highlight, or any external speakers from, uh, from another institution, uh, please email me and give me that information. 
and we'll we'll discuss it. Uh, I'll get on the phone with you, and we'll discuss the possibility, and and we'll and we'll uh, and we'll see if they can get on the schedule. So the next slide is just a couple other ways to get involved. Uh, we are going to launch uh, very soon the next gen newsletter. Um, I anticipate we'll probably be putting it out monthly uh, and uh, with, with updates. Um, we have a website um, that exists and uh, uh, it's, I think I've mentioned it before in the talk. I'm gonna mention it again in the next couple slides. Um, we're, we're upgrading the website um, it, uh, uh, and, and that's actively being done by, uh, by our communication team. We want you to help us look for other opportunities for our collaboration. So it, it, I've given you some examples of teams that already existed, that I've discovered that I think we can help, teams that we put together um, through NextGen. If, if you have any ideas of, uh, about how we can put teams of scientists together in some of our focus areas, or even if it's outside what looks like one of our traditional six columns, um, give us a call and, 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 we'll, and we, we want to work with you uh, to, uh, to see if we can um, uh, facilitate that, the, the, the scientists that, the, that you have in mind. And we can put the word out to find out if there are other scientists in your area uh, on, on the other campuses that you want that, for you to get involved with. Um, our faculty research leads, as I mentioned, are now in the phase where we are having a science seminar series, which are basically education series. They're informational, but with a lot of conversation. So they can be considered informational, educational, brainstorming, but not with the goal of getting a particular grant project in. And so there's a number of those that will be coming up. And um, we're going to be highlighting those in the newsletter. If you have ideas for a, a science seminar series, um, uh, or if you if there's one existing that you want to brand uh, as next gen, contact us, us, and we'll and, and we'll have that discussion with you. And then we're facilitating the faculty research leads are facilitating getting researchers together in certain identified areas and actually working on grants to submit. Um, so the drug addiction team, they are going gangbusters, and uh, uh, and so the, they they have a timeline on on what on to get some grants in this year. Uh, the uh, ALS team we pulled together. We're going to see if we've got enough uh, firepower there now to pull grants together, or if we need to wait and recruit some more faculty in this area. Uh, the community health team is um, is is meeting, and they have a number of grant ideas. And then uh, the cardiovascular and metabolic team that I mentioned, uh, the, the, the group that's going into the building, they already had a pretty uh, mature process for vetting grant ideas and getting them ready to put in. Um, but uh, uh, I'm, uh, and, and, they're, and they're moving ahead with that, but I really wanna see that group expand and, and, and include more um, uh, uh, interactions with our clinical cardiovascular and metabolic science uh, clinicians as well. So uh, if, if you think that we can help uh, facilitate getting a science seminar series off the ground uh, uh, it, or, uh, or convene a group that wants to work on a grant, um, we, are, uh, we have uh, personnel in the next gen a precision Health Initiative uh, that, that, can, that can help you do that. So you need to contact me. Next slide. So uh, speaking of uh, uh, science seminar series, Julie Cap, who's the faculty research lead of population health, uh, she has uh, put out information about uh, a population health science seminar that um, I, I think a lot of people have already signed up for it. It's February 19th. If you want to hear more about that, uh, give us give us a call or email us. Um, check on the website as it evolves, the precisionhealth.missouri.edu. And here is our contact information. So as I mentioned, uh, in addition to being EVC, I'm the executive director for, for this initiative. Tom Spencer and I are 
partners uh, in this uh, in this initiative. He's the scientific director as well as the other hats that he's wearing as a faculty research lead and now interim vice chancellor of research on the Columbia campus. Ashley Bird is our project manager, and Mary Hendel is our senior education program director. And I've relied on Mary and many others uh, in the communications team and, and Ashley Bird to get this uh, lecture series off the ground. So thank you, Mary, Ashley, and the entire communication team, which has been, I kind of gotten this talk together without all of their help and without getting it scheduled for all of you to hear it. So that's what I wanted to say. And now we have a grand opening slide, I believe is next. Uh, with confetti, with, with confetti. So just to remember our grand opening is October 19th. Um, COVID permitting, this will be a, uh, uh, an event that many people can attend. Um, I'm, I'm optimistic that we're going to be operating uh, close to normal at that point, um, but we're opening nevertheless on October 19th. And I think I'll end there and uh, I, believe that there's going to be some questions that are going to be read to me by Mary Hindle. Is that right, Mary? Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Barron. And the Q&A se section is available for people to enter their questions. And we've had some people already write in. Thank you for the presentation today. Um, I'll start it off with this question about, will the equipment of Precision Health be available to all researchers in the four campuses of the University of Missouri system? And how will the information about what is available and how to access it um, be communicated and then a follow-up on will there be charges? That's great. Um, yeah, I, uh, I should have mentioned it in the talk, but of course the, uh, the imaging equipment, the EM equipment, uh, the, well, the vivarium infrastructure, the clinical translational science unit, uh, the GMP facility, all is available to anybody. It's, it's, it, it, uh, while there are gonna be scientists in the building, um, we want everyone uh, to be uh, to have the opportunity to use this amazing uh, uh, facility and the equipment in it from all four campuses. And even if you're not on the campus, as I said, the Wash U uh, uh, folks are already very excited about using our 17 magnet. Um, so uh, will there be a charge? Yes, there's a charge. You know, you can't run science course without charges. So everyone will be charged, whether or not you're in the building or not. Um, but th that's pretty standard. Uh, and uh, over my career, uh, I've uh, uh, run cores and clinical translational science units. Dr. Spencer will be running the, 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 uh, the vivarium cores and the EM core. Dr. Altus will be running the radio imaging core. Um, uh, uh, I, for the meantime, will be running the uh, clinical translational science unit core, but we'll have a big team that to delegate that to as well. So there'll be charges for the use of all those facilities, but they'll be reasonable, I promise. And we build those charges into your grants. So if you have, if you anticipate that you're gonna be needing any of the uh, facilities, then you should work with us early while you're developing your grant project. And then when the grant goes in, obviously all that should be in the budget. So the, uh, uh, the grant resources should be able to pay for the cost for using this type, these type of amazing uh, equipment and facilities. Thank what else, you. Mary? So does next gen include research across the lifespan? I'm thinking about children in particular. Oh, sure. So uh, I gave you the example of the, the, the spinal muscular atrophy family. Um, the, I take care of and muscular dystrophy kids and spinal muscular atrophy kids. And that is next gen precision health to the max uh, when you can find the gene, gene defect and given therapy that alters the natural course of the disease. Uh, so yes, that uh, we wanna have a significant pediatric emphasis in this building um, uh, as we're planning our clinical translational science unit. Uh, 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 Dr. Layla Ghazal is part of the planning team, so she's keeping us very pediatric conscious as we as we build the unit um, to make sure that it it, it can accommodate uh, children that'll be in research trials as well as adults. Some of the uh, uh, researchers 
that are going in the cancer and immunology floor are actually in the Department of Child, uh, Child Health. Um, Great. So, yes. The and then pre important. Precision Health, this next question. So tailoring health solutions to specific individual patient needs would, would be perhaps more expensive in terms of delivering care to individuals. Given the health disparities that already exist in Missouri and that have become more prominent during the current pandemic, how would we use Precision Health to address current population health inequities and systemic inequalities? Well, that, that's a great question. And uh, Dr. Tapp, who runs our population health pillar uh, and, a, and a, has a large team, uh, including Dr. Jillian Bartlett, our new Dean for Population Health in the School of Medicine here. And it's basically looking at data. Um, so you have to be able to collect data on various populations uh, see what their health parameters are, see what the risk factors are, and figure out how to mitigate those risk factors. And to learn more about that, I would encourage you to, uh, to attend Dr. Kapp's uh, 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 talk on February 19, where she's going to be, uh, I'm sure you know a lot more about her on population health than you can from me. But yes, that is a huge focus of next gen. Thank you. Um, this next question says, Dr. Barron, a very nice overview. Are there plans to install human cell sorting machines? The reason I ask is in time of COVID, LIDR is not able to support basic science projects. In the future, um, this could become the norm. So are there dedicated core to support these endeavors if they're needed? In this building, I'm not sure. I will, uh, I will, I, I don't think that's going to happen in this building, um, and I will uh, defer to Dr. Spencer to, to uh, fill me in on where that can be done on campus. So send me an email, and I'll, and I'll give you the answer on that. Now, this next question um, is kind of um, about what you said earlier about population research. So with regards to that, can you elaborate on state or local jurisdiction partners who have agreed to work with MU in Precision Health? It would seem that the initiative would be a a fair bit of buy-in across jurisdictions in order to implement targeted population health recommendations? Or is this part of a work in progress already? Yeah, no, I, I think that's, uh, that's, that's a really timely question. And what, you know, one of the things that we have as a land-grant institution is we have our extension, our extension uh, team. And so we can reach out to every, uh, every area in the state of Missouri. And so our population health team is going to be uh, working with extension uh, and with our echo uh, with our echo program to uh, to find uh, healthcare partners that want to be involved in trials to uh, to educate uh, the folks in regions throughout the state what precision health is and to and and I think that they are as you're correct I think we're going to find a lot of partners as we roll this out. Um, our, our research partner in St. Louis, Wash U, sees that we have a huge advantage being a land-grant institution and having this extension access. And so uh, they actually are working with us so that we can um, get patients uh, and populations involved throughout the state to be part of next gen. Thank you. Will there be just-in-time internal grant mechanisms for pilot projects to pay the expenses of using these facilities during the pilot phase? Yeah, so that's a great that's a great idea, and I think we do need to develop that. Of course, we have there's a all of our campuses have their own individual uh, pilot grant funding programs. Uh, we have the the tier uh, system-wide grant funding program. Um, which uh, hopefully will be reacted, reactivated again once the financial picture is a little better. But we anticip I anticipate that we'll come back uh, in a year or so. Um, uh, I know that in on this campus in the School of Medicine, Dean's Wide has a pilot grant program that is remarkable uh, and gives fifty thousand dollars out in the Triumph Pilot Grant Awards. But that's a lot. That, that's actually a lot of funds. Uh, it, 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 it's, uh, it's almost the equivalent of, 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 a, of, a, of a small uh, NIH grant. So I think there actually is uh, the, uh, an advantage to having $5,000 just-in-time awards or something in that range 
that uh, people can apply for to be able to have either imaging access or EM access or some other type of tool. And uh, I've done that in the past. And that's one of the things that Dr. Spencer and I uh, want to try to get off the ground once we get in the building. Thank you. Yes. And Dr. Spencer is also um, commenting on here about um, the number of spectral um, based cell sorters and analyzers oh. in the cell and immunobi immunobiology core facility. Um, and there's also some other comments about um, assisting with LIDR that they have extensive capabilities and to reach out to them. So this final question as it's one o'clock, what is the threshold of external funding required to obtain space in the new building? And thank you. Or so Dr. Spencer in his new role as, uh, as VCR is, uh, is gonna be standardizing occupancy, occupancy roles for our premier centers, uh, which is, will be next gen and then Bond Life Sciences in Dalton. Uh, and so uh, uh, the, he, he's working on that plan. In order to get the scientists that we've already announced in the building now, they basically had to have an R01 or equivalent to be in the building, uh, and uh, uh, for, for the for the scientists that that we've already selected. And I anticipate that it'll stay roughly the same, but Dr. Spencer may tweak that a little bit. But it is necessary to have funding to get into the building. Okay, thank you. And for everyone um, listening, there was a question about the webinar being available later, and it will be on our website. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Barron. All right. Well, thank you, Mary. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Please give me feedback and uh, send me your ideas. Thank you very much.